Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, my name is Jula Ferenc Search. I would like to uh, share my progress report with you regarding uh, the investigation of safety and efficacy of surgical and conservative <coughs> knee cartridge preserving techniques. I work at the uh, Ujoki Hospital at the Department of Orthopedics and Traumatology. I'm also a PhD student, obviously, my supervisor is Jörn Mark Hangodi. Our vision is to decrease the number of total knee arthroplasties in Hungary, and we would like to achieve that by increasing the use of knee cartilage preserving techniques. We have two ongoing projects right now. The first project started September of last year. It's a meta-analysis of the topic of the comparison of the safety and efficacy of meniscal repair and meniscectomy during anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. About the background, anterior cruciate ligament connects the femur to the tibia. It provides anterior posterior rotation and stability inside the joint. There are around 200,000 ruptures per year in the United States, and from this number, annually, around 100,000 is repaired, and it's around 3,500 3, in Hungary. During an ACL rupture, there is a possibility of other lesions. For example, there is a lateral meniscus lesion in 55% of the cases, and there is a medial meniscus injury in 45% of the cases. Uh, these are the meniscus or the menisci of the knee joint. They are C-shaped fiber cartilage, and they have uh, also a big role in increasing stability and also distribute load inside the joint. There are two major treatment, operative treatment of the torn meniscus. One is menisectomy, which is remo removal of the damaged parts. Uh, this can lead to instability inside the joint. And the other uh, operative treatment is meniscus repair, which is basically suture of the damaged parts, and this way we can keep the stability in the joint. It has been shown that repairing or preserving the meniscus can prevent uh, the early onset osteoarthritis inside the knee. But still, in 94% of the cases, uh, there is a meniscectomy performed, and around 6% of the cases, there is a meniscal repair. There can be a lot of reasons for it. Uh, there is a select population, which is uh, in which we can do the meniscal repair regarding the localization of the tear or the timing of the tear. There is a longer surgical time associated with, the <coughs> with meniscal repair and it's a more difficult technique and also it's more costly. So our aim was to compare the safety and efficacy of meniscus repair and meniscectomy during primary ACL reconstruction. Uh, uh, we were investigating patients with concomitant ACL and meniscus tears. We compared the meniscus repair and meniscectomy during these operations. Our main outcomes was uh, list home score, IKDC, and Q score, and other uh, <coughs> outcomes such as failure rates and safety outcomes. So our, our hypothesis was that meniscus repair is going to be superior than meniscectomy. We conducted our search in October of last year in these three major databases. And after the selection process, we had 22 uh, eligible full texts. Our first outcome was the Lisholm score. It's a, it's a score system that is used for assessing knee injuries. It's a patient reported subjective outcome, and it ranges between 0 and 100 points. Uh, we have our results on a forest plot here. We included three articles, two of which we could separate medial and lateral meniscus injuries and their operation. Uh, as you can see, we uh, compared the changes from preoperative to postoperative results. And in this case, we had the mean difference was 2.6, which is considering it's a 100-point score system. It's not significantly uh, different, neither statistically, neither clinically. Our next outcome was the Q-score. Just as before, it's a patient-reported subjective outcome. It also ranges between 0 and 100 but it's a little bit more intricate. It has five subgroups. If we look at only at the results, from the five, there has been one uh, result, which is statistically uh, significant, but it's only 1.6 1. 1. points, so it's clinically not significant difference between the two interventions. We could separate the medial meniscus injuries at, at the Q-score. We could see that all of the five subgroups, there were no significant difference we also managed to separate the lateral meniscus injuries, but we have all the same results here. Okay, our next outcome is the IKDC score system. 
is just as before. It's also a patient reported outcome. It also ranges between zero and 100 points. And as you can see the results, this one also uh, didn't give us a significant difference between the two interventions, although it was a little bit uh, favoring the meniscus repair. And our last uh, meta-analysis results is uh, done by KT Arthrometer. Uh, this device examines the anterior translation of the tibia relative to the femur, so it measures uh, sagittal instability. We also have the same result here, that there is no significant difference. This one also favors the repair. Okay, so the strengths and limitations of our article. Uh, what we can uh, say, that this meta-analysis, the most comprehensive meta-analysis in the topic uh, since conception, we could include much more studies than before, and we, we have also more outcomes, and we could separate the medial and lateral meniscus injuries. Our limitation is that we couldn't find any RCTs, so they were no, not available. We could only include mostly retrospective studies. Uh, in the included studies, time to surgery was heterogenic. Follow-up time was different, although it was around one or two years. Uh, obviously, different type of meniscal tears and different localization can, be, uh, can lead to a different surgical options. And also in the included studies, there were differences in the ACR reconstruction techniques. So, based on our results, the conclusion is that we did not find any significant difference in the, the either surgical interventions, which has the implication for practice that uh, regarding short-term <coughs> short outcomes, uh, both, of the, uh, operate <coughs> both of the interventions lead to the same results, so they are, they are just as good as the other, but uh, we have much more implication for research which uh, means that we need RCTs in the topic. Uh, in these RCTs, we should uh, have a much longer follow-up times at five or 10 years at least, because then probably we are going to see the, the chondroprotective results of meniscus repair. And also, <coughs> also we should uh, examine uh, different age groups. So this is the manuscript status right now. The, the article is internal review. Okay, the second project started also in last year. It's uh, going to be a network meta-analysis. It's, it's investigating the safety and efficacy of intraarticular injections in the treatment of neo-osteoarthritis. This is a very hot topic right now. A little bit about the background. Osteoarthritis is a degenerative joint disease. It's uh, basically the result of breakdown of joint cartilage and the underlying bone surface. The most common symptoms are well known, joint pain, swelling, and decreased range of motion. It's uh, osteoarthritis affecting around 30 million people in the United States alone, and it has been said that around 80% of all osteoarthritic cases is related to the knee joint. Okay, so what about knee osteoarthritis? There are two major treatment ways, obviously surgical or conservative. Surgical usually means total knee arthroplasty, and uh, as well as <coughs> Sorry, conservative, can, uh, conservative therapy has a lot of options. One of the most used is intraarticular injections because they are non-invasive and they have a low risk of harm. There are several types of intraarticular injections that exist. Most known are corticosteroid, platelet rich plasma, hyaluronic acid, botulinum toxin, and a lot of other uh, options. But despite having this much options, there is no clear recommendation today. Uh, we found recent studies that uh, showed great success if we combined hyaluronic acid with PRP. So we thought that we would look at literature and if we can find an answer for this question. So we want to uh, compare these different <coughs> kind of article injections in the therapy of knee osteoarthritis. Okay, so our patient selection is patients with knee osteoarthritis and we are going to compare these different intraarticular methods. And our hypothesis is that if we co combine PRP, platelet-rich plasma with hyaluronic acid, it's going to be superior to the other intraarticular options. Okay, we conducted our systematic search in August of this year. We got more than 5,000, uh, almost 5,000 uh, articles, and we are doing the selection process right now. You can see the search key here. Okay, so this is our two ongoing projects right now. Thank you for your attention.
Congratulations, Julia, on your uh, presentation. Uh, it's con uh, my question uh, concerns uh, your second project that uh, um, there are a lot of uh, intra-articular um, uh, injections that you can use. And uh, um, as you said, uh, that you are investigating the effects of hyaluronic acid and, uh, and PRP. Uh, but um, um, if, if I'm correct, then PRP is, uh, is still not uh, authorized in Hungary, right? So, uh, which, uh, which is the... Um, the injection what you use the most often, um, whether it's hyaluronic acid or, or steroid. Mm -hmm. So, thank you for your question, Luca. First of all, yeah, it's to my knowledge, PRP is banned in Hungary, but, but there are a few institutes that use it. We all know patients come from there and they say yes, they tell it to us. Uh, but also, luckily, it's, it's planned to be a meta-analysis, so it's not necessary regarding Hungary. It's we just want to know the answer for the, and maybe if of course, yeah, we yes, can yes. show that PRP is the best option, then maybe it's going to be unbanned in Hungary. Mm -hmm.